questions, but first I want to start with kind of pushing options, right? So I think a lot of people don't Pushing is really intimidating, especially to a first-time mom, um, because you're you're you've never done that before. Your body has never gone through something like that, so it's kind of intimidating to think about, um, you know, what pushing is going to be like. Um, and so I get a ton, ton, ton of questions about pushing, and I've talked about it a lot, but I feel like we can go through it all again. So let's start with kind of the different types of pushing, because I think that a big variable that's gonna come into play when you're thinking about pushing is whether or not you've had pain management meds, right? So a lot of moms in the United States especially um, get pain management meds, right? Especially the epidural, it's the most common one. Um, it's effective, usually works really well, um, but it can mess with how you push, right? And what your pushing experience is like. So if you're planning to get an epidural or you're considering getting an epidural, that's okay, no judge zone. Um, just know that your pushing experience may be a little bit different. And what I mean by that is that for one, your pushing stage may be longer. So an epidural can cause your pushing stage to be longer. So kind of something to keep in mind, right? Also, you might not feel the urge to push. So when you've had an epidural, if it's working properly and if it's doing its job, you might not feel anything, which is good because that's what you want. You don't want to feel in pain. If you got the epidural for pain, you don't want to feel pain. The thing is, you won't feel the urge to push. You won't feel the baby coming down. So when it comes time to push, you're going to really be relying on your doctors, on your provider and your nurses, whoever's there with you, your midwife, to you know kind of guide you through pushing. So let's talk a little bit about the epidural experience first. So suppose you've had an epidural. Um, what's super common in hospitals and with other providers really is to hold off on pushing until you reach 10 centimeters dilated, right? So you hear that super common, like once you hit 10 centimeters, it's time to push. That's not always the case and you don't have to. So the whole point here is that, you know, you have the option, assuming there's no issues and there's no emergency and there's a medical problem, you have the option of delaying your start of your pushing stage until you're ready. So even if you hit 10 centimeters dilated, you don't have to start pushing right away. I'm sure you're probably thinking like, why would I wait? Like, what's the big deal if I'm in labor? I just want this baby out. I get you. I, I mean, I totally understand that. Um, think about the baby's fetal station. And so what I mean by that is um, when, so this is your pelvis, right? And so the baby starts out kind of hanging out up here in your stomach, right? And he or she has to move down, move down, move down, move down, right? So they're de descending. And when you reach a certain point, when the baby reaches a certain point, um, the doctors start measuring where they are by something called fetal station. So consider where the baby is. So if the baby's still pretty high and you start pushing, you have a lot more work to do to get her out right? But if you can hold off until you've had, you know, the baby's had a chance to descend further and is closer to crowning or closer to coming out and possibly already crowning because the baby will keep moving down. Contractions are what's pushing the baby down. So as long as your uterus up, up at the top of your uterus is contracting, the baby's going to keep getting pushed down and descending down to the, you know, to the opening to come out of your vagina, really. So as long as you're still having contractions that are pushing the baby down, she's going to keep moving down. So starting to push too early can extend your pushing phase and can really exhaust you. So if you've had an epidural, um, and if you guys are hopping on now, feel free to say hi so I know who's here. And if you have questions, um, pop them in the comments so I can answer your questions as I go. Um, I'm starting with pushing. And right now I'm talking pushing with an epidural and what your options are. So you don't have to start pushing as soon as you hit 10 centimeters, right? So you can hold off a little bit if you like, and it's something called like laboring down. You can give your body a chance to rest is one, you know, nice example, you know, thing, benefit from that. Also, you can give the baby a chance to come down on her own until her head is really crowning before you start actually pushing. Um, okay, so... What they call it when your provider is kind of guiding you through pushing, if you've had an epidural and you can't feel anything, you're probably going to be relying on them to kind of guide you through that. And that's kind of called coached pushing. Coach pushing isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, so long as your wishes are being honored and, you know, your um, preferences are being respected, right? So coach pushing is not a bad thing, so long as it's not something where 
you know, you've got people screaming at you or yelling at you. And I have heard a lot of moms that say that, you know, that providers were, you know, and nurses, not all of them, because some of them are amazing. Um, but there are some examples and nurses know too, because they've seen it too, where women, moms tend to get yelled at, or, you know, you have a really like urgent feeling situation when it may not be an urgent situation. It may not be a medical emergency, but doctors sometimes tend to put a little bit of urgency on birth when it may or may not be necessary. So before you allow their urgency to become your urgency, you know, really take a step back and think about what's going on during birth. Hey, Emma, good morning. Um, what time is it your time? So before you start, you know, letting other people's urgency become your urgency, really think about what's going on. And if it's a need to be, you know, an urgent situation, is this something that's a medical condition or a problem that needs to be addressed like immediately? Or is it something that you can really take your time? You know, so why rush if you don't need to rush? It's kind of my point. All right, let me make sure that we are streaming in the group too. I forward and share to make sure we're running. Yep, okay, we're here. All right, so um, now let's talk about if you don't, nine o'clock. Okay, so you are 10, 11 mountain, mountain time. Um, it's 11 o'clock here, so it is a.m., but we're getting close to lunchtime, um, close to midday, and I get up at the crack of dawn. So for me, I feel like I've had a full day already, um, but I'm still going. I'm still going. It's fun. All right, so now we're going to switch and talk a little. Well, we covered epidural, right? So we covered your epidural experience during pushing. Um, side note doesn't always happen this way, but this is a question that comes up a ton, is if I've had an epidural, what can I do to prevent tearing um, during pushing? And the short answer is you can never, you know, I can't guarantee that you won't tear. You can't completely prevent tearing always. It's not a guarantee, right? But there are things you can do to minimize your chances of tearing or to what degree, to what extent you tear. So if you've had an epidural, what I would suggest a great thing to use is a peanut ball. And it looks like a yoga ball, but it's in the shape of a peanut. And so if you've had an epidural, it's something that you can use when you're laying in bed and switch sides with the peanut ball in between your legs because it'll help your pelvis continue to open. I'm so excited to bring our little girl into this world in 35 weeks today. Yay! So when's your due date? That's so exciting. I'm so glad you're here. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, you know, my tip on if you've had an epidural. Uh, and also, you don't have to, even if you've had an epidural, you don't have to push flat on your back. So you can push sideline if you've had an epidural, which is a great position to minimize your chances of tearing. So, you know, I've pushed sideline. I really liked it. And it's one of those, you know, studied and proven um, pushing positions that does reduce your chances of tearing. All right. So let's assume you're having no drugs and you're going all natural. Now, when you're pushing without drugs, it's a completely different experience because you feel a lot of moms, not all, but most moms, you feel everything and so you feel the urge to push and so it's you can really tune in and listen to your body and kind of go um go with what your body you know is feeling in the moment and so a lot of moms describe it as kind of an uncontrollable urge like you just cannot control it even if you wanted to um what you can do is kind of breathe and always go back to your breath during pushing you know if you haven't had epidural especially and you know you're experiencing some discomfort and the baby's crowning or whatnot and you're in that pushing phase focus on your breath like always go back to your breath and you know not that you can stop the baby from coming out but you can certainly kind of you know breathe into the pushing really which is kind of odd to say and if you haven't experienced it it might be a weird concept um, but in the moment if you always just remember to go back to your breathing is huge and not to kind of clench up that's not what you want that's not helpful in pushing all right so um, we described the urge to push if you um, oh Emma April 2nd yay all right so yeah you're only like just about a month out that's so exciting oh so you're having a girl I'm so excited I love my girls. I mean, I love my boy. I love all my kids. Girls are spe special. They're like special sweet. I can and I'm scared because it's my first child. I completely understand the feeling. I remember. I know how you feel like that. And you're not the only mom who feels that way. So know that you're not alone in that. Sorry for the door chiming. Um, that's the door when it opens and shuts. So, I mean, tons of moms that I talk to privately experience you know fear of birth so i completely completely understand and i had it too so i know and that's 
I'm glad you're here because we have lots to talk about, right? And if you haven't already caught up, I uploaded the first, you know, one, two, three videos of this series are uploaded and saved on Nicole Joy. And so you can go back and catch up with those too. So as you're going through your birth plan template and kind of writing down things that you're interested in having at your birth, um, you know, go back through these videos because I find them super helpful to kind of prepare moms for the day and kind of talking through what your options are. All right, so speaking of tearing, I wanna talk a little bit about if you're faced with a situation where you need to choose between an episiotomy and a natural tear. So this is something that isn't always an option. I mean, you can certainly say no episiotomy, but there are situations where an episiotomy can be super helpful. Um, so for example, if, if, the, if there is a more urgent situation and the baby's heart rate is um, of concern to the doctor, or you know, for some other reason, they, there's something going on with the you know, umbilical cord, like umbilical cord prolapse or something like that, um, and it's urgent, a doctor may recommend you get an episiotomy to avoid having a C-section. And so episiotomies, they suck. They really do. Like, there's no nice way to put it. But are they better than a cesarean? Probably. I think a lot of moms would agree yes, right? Um, because you're talking about a cut on the outside of your skin versus, um, you know, a major abdominal surgery. So there are times when episiotomies may be called for, and this is something you can have a conversation with your provider about if you don't want to have a standard routine episiotomy, which most doctors do not do anymore anyways, but it's worth having the conversation with them about, you know, in what situation would they do an episiotomy? And so you can have that conversation. And uh, if you're wondering, there's a lot of people who believe that having an episiotomy would give you a guaranteed, you know, certain amount of a cut, of a, of a tear or a cut down there in the perineum versus having a natural tear. Um, I'll tell you why myself and a lot of people would say that a natural tear is preferred. So think about a piece of fabric if you run to the fabric store, right? And so if you go to the fabric store and you pick up a piece of fabric and you just start pulling at it, right? It's unless there's some, um, some kind of fraying or something, it's kind of hard to tear usually, right? Now let's say you take that same piece of fabric and a pair of scissors and snip it and then pull where the snip is. Can you visualize where it's going? Like it's a lot easier to tear through that fabric if it's already been snipped. And so I know this is kind of a you know grotesque thing to think about, but it's reality. And so we need to talk about it. Um, I'm looking this way to see if I have my pelvis because I wanted to show my pelvis. I think I have it, so I'll grab it in a second. Um, so, when, when we talk about tearing, um, this is not a great, you know, super scientific visual, but I'm going to go with it because it's the easiest visual I can get right now. So let's assume this is your this is your vaginal opening and you're getting ready for birth. This bottom area down here, this is the perineum. So the skin at the bottom that connects that connects to your rectum, that's the perineum. So the very bottom section, and during birth when they talk about perennial tearing, it's usually down here. Now there are people who tear at the top but it's most common that women will tear down here. And so, um, and that's usually where an episiotomy is done. So if the baby needs to be, you know, needs to be out quickly to avoid a C-section, your doctor may recommend an episiotomy where they snip the bottom. And so if it's absolutely urgent, it may be a great thing. Otherwise, you may not want that, right? So a natural tear does heal better um, you know, and it, and it can, because it's a natural tear. And so you're not giving the, that initial, because sometimes when, when they do it a little episiotomy and you continue to push the baby out, it can tear further. So that's kind of where I'm going with that. Okay, Marissa, I'm going to attempt no epidural. If my body has the urge to push, should I just listen to my body or wait till my provider tells me to do so? Girl, listen to your body. And are you coming on Instagram with me too? I hope so. But, um, no, I'd say listen to your body because, um, you know, you can do it the way you want, right? It's entirely up to you. If it were me, I'd probably just listen to my body because your body's gonna be driving everything. Like if there's a urgent situation, where do you live again, Marissa? I can't remember what time zone you're in or what state you're in. Um, if there's an urgent situation, you may need you know, your doctor to kind of take the lead and you know, guide you through something. But if there's no issues, you know, and if there's nothing of concern going on, then throughout your entire labor, I would always suggest listening to your body. Right. And so the best example I can kind of give you is my third birth because that was my natural birth. And, you know, I listened to my body the whole 
time. Like every single position I moved in, every time I went and sat on the toilet, every time I was like leaning over, um, I'm pointing because there's a little couch thing, a chase back there. Like I leaned over the chase, I was leaning over the bed. Um, the noises I was making when I felt like I was ready to start pushing, I just had to like totally tune in and listen to what my body needed, like position wise and all those things. Okay, you're in West Virginia, and I'll probably be on Instagram too. Yay! Your hubby's asleep, and you're so bored. Oh, good, good, because they probably freaked him out to hear some of this, right? Um, oh, Emma, your daughter's been head down since 27 weeks, so she's ready. She's oh, good, baby, good baby. Um, not that breech babies are bad, but you know, we love head down. We love head down babies. Um, just makes it easier for mom. You know, makes it easier for you. West Virginia girl. So I have roots in West Virginia. Mm -hmm on my mom's side. Um, I remember going there one time when we were, when I was a kid and, um, we drove to like the local Walmart. There was like nothing around. I don't know what part of West Virginia we were in, but there was like nothing, like nothing there. And we drove to the Walmart and I thought, holy crap, like everybody in the entire state is at Walmart right now. Like that's where everybody was and everybody owns a truck. Like you cannot live in West Virginia without a truck. It's a thing. I'm pretty sure it's a thing. Right? So yeah. Um, you know, I think you tuning in and listening to your body and feeling that urge to push. Um, and I probably have something I need to send you, Marissa, too. I think I have your email. So I'm going to I'm going to reach out to you separately too to send you something that I want you to see. Um, so we talked to natural tearing versus a pediotomy and then kind of listening to your body's urge to push. Now, if you're feeling the urge to push, um, you can what I mentioned before. I don't know if you were on yet, but like, yeah, you were on. So like breathing, really breathing into it. Emma, it's been really hard. I live in Arizona and the doctors have been giving me loads of trouble and I just don't have anybody to talk to about it and it's really hard. Yeah, no, I, I do. I understand because I'm in the Southeast and the birth culture here sucks. Um, they won't listen to me and I know my body better than they do and they still try to force things. That's so unfortunate. And so can you give me an example of that if it's not too personal? Like, you know, what's an example of something that you want that they're trying to push? Um, yeah, you know, I'm just curious about, but I mean, I totally believe that that happens so much and it makes me so angry. Um, but I'm glad you're here to talk because now you, I want you to feel like you have a place to come to talk about these things. And I want to help you, you know, kind of be your own best advocate. You are your own best advocate. And so sometimes, I mean, I've heard some pretty interesting conversations that women have to have with their providers and it really sucks that it has to be like that sometimes. Um, but I think that the more that you kind of set those boundaries for yourself and for your pregnancy and for your birth, um, you are setting yourself up for a better experience, right? Because if you know your body, you're right, you do know your body better than anybody. Now, if there's something that's obviously staring everybody in the face that's a real medical concern, like that's one thing. But, you know, listening to your body and listening to yourself, like you know your body. And so um, you, what you don't need is for them to try to force things on you. Okay. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, let's talk about the mirror and catching the baby. Okay, so some providers will ask you if you want to have a mirror and to see when the baby's crowning. And so you may or may not, it may be something you're into, maybe not. So a lot of moms like it because it gives you a, a place to focus when you're pushing. So if you've had an epidural, it's kind of hard to visualize, like to push where you don't feel anything and you don't see anything, like it's hard to push. So sometimes having a mirror down there where you can see baby's head, you're like, okay, and you can kind of focus your pushing efforts into that area. And so when I say focusing your pushing efforts, like you really need to use your whole body when you're pushing, like it takes your whole body to push. And so that's why the two vaginal births I've had, um, especially my second birth, when I had an epidural and I pushed for two hours because that epidural can extend your pushing stage. Um, my body pushing for two hours was so physically tired. And so, you know, I don't think I, I did not realize how much effort it would take, you know, and how much it would take for my body to really do all that pushing for two hours. It takes a lot. Um, it's, it's not easy work, right? Um, so yeah, and a mirror might be something that can really help you to focus. Now, 
not everybody likes the mirror. And my second, she offered me the mirror and I was, I, I just couldn't, it was distracting. So I turned it down. And so, you know, just kind of go with how you feel in the moment. You may think you want something or don't want something. And in the moment you might change your mind. Just know that it's an option. Um, all right. And then catching the baby, who's going to catch the baby. So your doctor doesn't have to be the one to catch the baby. If you want your husband to catch her or him or Emma, like if you want your husband or your mom or your best friend, or if you want to do it, you know, so I've seen moms give birth standing up and they just reach down and grab the baby and pull them right up assuming the umbilical cord is long enough and can reach right um but i've seen moms that do it themselves you know and it's entirely up to you right so you can definitely suggest or ask for unless there's a, something going on you can ask for whoever you want to catch the baby when they come out your doctor doesn't have to be the one your doctor might want to be down there checking on everything make sure everything's going okay but you may want somebody you know different or close to you um emma like, for example, I had to go to Phoenix because I said she was too small, two ounces smaller than what she should have been. Two ounces. And then to come to find out, I told them she'd be fine. And I went to the doctor's appointment and find out she was fine. And I've had another incident that I had two miniature strokes and they didn't do anything about it. And I wanted to make sure she was okay. And I never checked on her, but I knew she was going to be okay. And there's other incidents like here they're very strict on the drug rules and I've never touched one drug and they put me on drug watch. Wow. That just seems a little ridiculous. Like it really does. That seems a little bit ridiculous. I'm sorry you're going through that. Um, and I would urge you to continue to be, you know, your best, you know, your own advocate because it sounds like you're really going to have to keep creating those boundaries for yourself. Um, and this is such a good time. You know, I talk a lot about boundaries because I was not somebody who understood what it meant to set healthy boundaries for myself growing up. And it was something I had to learn as an adult, especially the further into motherhood I go, because you think about, um, you know, what kind of life you want to have, what kind of parenting you want to, you know, parent you want to be, what kind of environment you want to raise your children in. And so you really have to be very conscious of how you live your life. And what part of that is setting boundaries in your life. And it can be really uncomfortable if you've never been someone who does that. If you've been a people pleaser or you just, you know, you, you say yes, or, you know, you just want everybody, you want to, you know, you don't want to like rock the boat. Um, but this is the time that it's okay to rock the boat and to stand up for yourself and to ask for things and demand things if they're needed or insist on no, if they're not right. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm really sorry that you're dealing with that because that's not an easy thing. Abigail, hello. Do you discuss your birth plan with your doctor before birthday or just show up and surprise the doctor how natural and hands off you really want the birth to be? I would highly recommend um, discussing it with your provider in advance. So as you go through your birth plan, this is what I always do. So I have a free template on my website that's long. It is long. And please don't think that you need to use that whole thing because that's not why I made it so long. I made it so long so you could see all the options I could think of for every section of, you know, birth. And then what you want to do is delete stuff that doesn't apply to you. So you keep having like this draft going. So it's an electronic download, a digital download, and then you just keep working on it. And so when you go to the doctor, it'll you'll see things in it that you'll think, okay, I wonder if that's protocol or how my doctor handles that. So for an example is a few minutes ago, we talked about natural tearing versus episiotomy. And if you're totally like, if you're hands off, you might say like, I really don't want an episiotomy. So you might have that conversation with your doctor at one of your appointments, like, hey, um, in what situations do you typically perform an episiotomy? And can I go ahead and suggest now? Or you may even take a copy to your um, hospital tour and ask the hospital what their protocol is on certain things. Because if what you want is protocol, you don't need it in the birth plan. So you don't want to have this like really long document with all this stuff in it that might not need to be there, right? It's there for you to be aware of it at the beginning and have these conversations set up. So like the episiotomy example, if your doctor and your hospital both say that they do not do routine episiotomies only for emergency situations, then you probably don't need to leave that um, in your birth plan. Now, let me think of another example. Um, pushing, let's talk pushing. So if you, okay, it looks like you're going to be doing natural. Um, let's talk, talk pushing positions for your example. I think this would tie in really well. So you may have a conversation with your doctor in advance and let them know that this is the kind of birth you want to have. I think that it's okay to set, again, it's setting those boundaries. It's talking about your expectations. It's, you know, taking, being the driver's seat of your own birth. And so if you set those um, expectations in advance, like this is the kind of birth that I want, and maybe you don't want to be offered pain management meds. Just say, you know, I don't want to be offered at all. If in the moment you decide, and it's entirely your choice that you want 
nitrous oxide or something like that, maybe you say, only if I ask for it, but I don't want every nurse coming in just assuming and asking me if I'm ready for an epidural. Because sometimes just hearing that can really you know, get in your head unnecessarily. You might not want to hear that, you know, during birth. Um, so pushing positions was another thing I was going to mention for you, Abigail. So maybe you talk to your provider and the hospital about pushing positions and, um, you know, kind of let them know that maybe one of your, one of your preferences is to be able to push in whatever position feels good in the moment. So if you're going natural and you want the birth to be hands off, maybe you push standing up right maybe you're in the shower if they have if you have access to a shower right so maybe you want to be in the water and if you feel like pushing at the moment you know or maybe you want to be on all fours so all fours is a really a lot of women really like pushing on all fours when they haven't had pain management meds and one of the nice things about being on all fours is that's one of the pushing positions that can minimize um, tearing so maybe talk about those things so i definitely would have those conversations with your doctor so that, that you're not like um, dealing with, I don't want to say confrontation, but awkward things the day of. And so if you're going natural, when the day comes, um, you're probably going to have, your hormones are really going to be kicking in. And so when you're in that labor land place, you're probably not going to want to have to have those conversations. So it may be better to start having them now. Right. And that way, if you start, if things start to come up, you can deal with them now. And for some women, what that means is that they have to switch providers. I don't know how far along you are. How far along are you, Abigail? Um, so if that means you might have to switch. Oh, Abigail Joy. I just clicked on your name. Abigail, you know, that's special to me because I'm Nicole Joy. Um, so, you know, I don't know how far along you are, but for some women, myself included, I switched providers at 31-ish weeks with my second baby. And I'm not suggesting that that's something you need to do. But for anybody who's watching this or who watches the replay, um, you know, if you're having those conversations and it just doesn't feel like your provider is really hearing you and really listening to you and supporting your decisions, reasonable, dis you know, um, requests, then that may be something that you end up con being confronted with, a decision you may have to make, right? Um, Emma, see, I think this is very helpful because I brought, I've brought when I want to go for her birth and they won't even talk to me about that. And they don't even do tours at the hospital or anything here. So I feel a little scared not knowing what's to come. Like I was saying, they don't do tours. And I don't know if it's common, but we had to see every doctor in the OBGYN office. So I just don't have one doctor. And they're all off in La La Land, all of them. They're not talking to each other. Um, I, it is common to see all the doctors or they rotate you. So that is common. I've always experienced that when you go to a bigger practice. And yeah, that way you've seen or at least met most or all of the providers so that whoever's on call the day that you go into labor, that you're familiar with that person. Um, Marissa, I'm almost 30 weeks. So should I start discussing things with my provider now? I would. Yeah. It's never too soon. You know, I actually did my hospital tour with my third pregnancy at 14 weeks because I had moved back to Florida and I knew I wanted a VBAC. And in Florida, it's not a super VBAC friendly state or area. And so I really wanted to make sure early on that I knew who was going to be supportive. And so I started doing those things really early, you know, because you have, and if you're almost 30 weeks, your um, doctor's appointments are going to start picking up in frequency. So this is a great time to start doing those things. And have you been on your hospital tour yet, Marissa? I can't remember. And Abigail, you're 31 weeks due April 27th. So you guys are really close, Abigail and Marissa. So yeah, I think um, having those conversations, because now if you start, you know, going through the birth plan and you're like, wait a minute, I wonder if my provider, so I'll give you some examples, like real life stuff that I did. I don't like to talk about, um, you know, some of my client specific things because it's, it can be, you know, super personal, right? Um, Abigail, I live in a small town and there are no other doctors, just Amish midwife. Ooh, okay. You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how the Amish midwives work. Um, but if you're planning to go natural, they might be pretty supportive. I don't know if they would let you birth. I don't know what the rules are with that. I'm really not familiar. You live in a small town. Where, where is your small town? I'm so curious. I'm all curious. I want to know all the things. Um, so a real life example. So um, when I was, when I did my hospital tour, my 14 weeks of my third pregnancy, um, I didn't bring my birth plan template because I kind of know most of the stuff, but I did have some notes of questions I wanted to write down and ask while we were doing the tour, um, because some things that were important to me, for example, and we're going to get into this too, um, was 
placenta, you know, my placenta, um, delaying umbilical cord clamping. Um, what else? Some options with my, if, if I needed to have a repeat C-section, there were certain things that I wanted to do. And so I started, so the reason I asked them at the hospital tour is because I wanted to know what their protocol was. So for example, the umbilical cord clamping, the hospital protocol was, I want to say 30 seconds or 60 seconds. And so I made sure to talk to, once I found that out and I jotted it down on the paper next to it, I went to my next doctor's appointment. I said, look, you know, this is what I want and this is what the hospital protocol is. So I want to go beyond the hospital protocol. Are you cool with that? You know, basically, is that fine? And the doctors, you know, the midwives that I was seeing, you know, they were pretty supportive. So depending on what you're asking, um, I would have those conversations because you need to, you know, so I did include that on my birth plan um, because I wanted a longer clamping period, you know, delay. I wanted a longer delay than the hospital protocol. So those are things that you'd want to put in your birth plan. Marissa, you haven't been on your birth tour yet. They haven't mentioned it. I wasn't sure if it was something I needed to bring up. They probably won't mention it. And that's what kind of, that's what kind of sucks. And I don't know if I can cuss on Facebook, so I might save it for Instagram. But I'm going to spell it for you because parents spell S-H-I-T. So um, the... Society does a SHIT job at preparing women for birth, for motherhood, for all this. They really do a crap job. So they probably won't bring it up um, because they just, they have a lot of people to see. Generally, they don't have a lot of time for that. And so it's on us to really go above and beyond and to take that responsibility and really like take ownership of the process. And so, you know, you're probably going to need to make the call and check with the hospital to get into the tour. Um, I would do it, you know, as soon as you can, really. It's never too soon. It's a good idea because you want to see where to go when you're in, tri you know, for triage. You want to get a feel for, like, where you're supposed to be parking, where you go, what the rooms are like, what requests you can make. I always request to have water access if possible. So sometimes there's only one or two rooms with a laboring tub. I mean, if at all. But if they have things like that, you want to know so that you can request it if you want it. You may not want water when the time comes, but you might, you might want to sit in the tub or you might want to sit in the shower. Um, and so you want to make sure you have like all the questions, all the things, you know, in your draft template so that you have ideas of what you want to be asking about that suits you. Um, restrictions for what you can wear, you know, because if you, if you're planning to have continuous um, electronic fetal monitoring, you may be limited with the type of clothing you can wear. Um, but if you're not going to have that, if you prefer to have a different type of monitoring, you may be able to wear your own clothes and that might be important to you. So yeah, those are, those are kind of important things to bring up and to look into for sure. Um, Angie, I live in West Virginia also and was never offered a hospital tour at my first. I had no idea that was even a thing until recently. Yeah, that's wild, isn't it? I didn't do a hospital tour at my first either. And that's part of the reason why I don't shut up now because after the fact, there was a lot of things that had I done the hospital tour, had somebody told me about that, I would have learned a lot of things about my first, which was a C-section, um, that I would have done differently because I would have known what my options were. And I didn't know because nobody told me this stuff. Like nobody talked to me about this. Um, so we have to change that because people need to know. Um, Emma, okay, I have one more question. I'm sorry to bother you guys. It's not bothering me. I called my OBGYN because I started having diarrhea and it looked I looked it up online. They say it's a startup process labor, and I'm wondering if it's really true. It can be. So not always. So maybe you ate something. It could just be your stomach's messed up. But, you know, diarrhea is a common sign of labor. And Emma, I can't remember how far along you are. Did you write it? I don't know. If, yes, you did. You were a month. You were about a month out, right? Um, yeah, 35 weeks. I was scrolling back to make sure I didn't miss anything. So it can be definitely. And then, you know, if, if it's really labor, it would be accompanied by other indicators. So other signs, so maybe contractions that are increasing in uh, strength, length and frequency, um, or if your water breaks. So I would keep an eye on it and just kind of see what else goes on because you're 35 weeks. So, you know, it, things could happen much sooner, right? Brown city, Michigan, Abigail. Okay. I don't, I don't know where that is. They're very strict and don't deliver English babies. Okay, yeah, I kind of was. I kind of figured that they may not let. They may not let you. Okay, so there you are restricted to that provider. Um, there's no other doctors. Yeah, so then you know that's going to be a really big um, activity. I'm trying to find the right word. That's going to be a big thing for you to really you know become your own advocate, your own best advocate, you and your partner or whoever's your support system to really make sure that your wishes are honored, right? No matter what happens, no matter what comes up, that your wishes are honored. Things can come up and things might not go to plan. We know that, right? Uh, but knowing that your wishes are honored is everything. 
Okay, so um, let's move on a little bit to, all right, we talked crowning a little bit. We talked about who do you want to catch your baby. Um, let's talk about the placenta, okay? Because this is a surprise to a lot of moms that you have to deliver your placenta. So after the baby comes out, after you birth the baby, um, the placenta, you have to birth it. So if you're unfamiliar, um, the placenta is a brand new organ that your body has built and grown to nurture the baby, to feed the baby, all the things. And the placenta, when you're early in your pregnancy, is attached to the inside of your uterus. And so after you birth, the, and it's attached to the baby, so this is your uterus. It's kind of shaped a little bit different, but uterus. Placenta is usually, it's attached, could be attached kind of anywhere really, but let's say it's just attached right here. And then it's there's an umbilical cord. And I actually have a better image visualization. Um, yeah, let me grab it. I have, of course, of course I have a placenta because doesn't everybody have a placenta? Yeah, this is my life. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Here's your placenta. This is kind of, so it looks like the tree of life, an umbilical cord. So this is attached to your inside of your uterine wall, so your uterus, and then there's the umbilical cord. And the umbilical cord is attached to your baby, right? Placenta, baby, umbilical cord in the middle. Okay, so after the baby comes out, the placenta is going to detach from your uterine wall, hopefully all in one piece. Hopefully it'll be a nice clean, you know, detachment and you have to birth it. So it's very common for hospitals to, to use Pitocin as a protocol, um, meaning that they will use it for everybody as a protocol unless you request not to. So that is something that if it's important to you, like some of the moms here who are not, sorry, I keep my ringer on, I know that's rude, but I have kids that are at school and I'm always afraid I'm gonna get a call. So I keep the ringer on, so sorry guys. Um, but that was probably some telemark, I don't know, 1-800 number. Um, so, and they just totally messed up my train of thought. Okay, protocol, Pitocin. So it's common protocol in hospitals to give a mom Pitocin um, to when she is birthing the placenta. Why? Because Pitocin is very effective, and Pitocin is a drug, right? Pitocin is artificial oxytocin. It's very effective at preventing a blood hemorrhage. Um, okay, so, but not everybody hemorrhages. Not everybody has an issue birthing our placentas. So for a lot of women, you might not need the placenta. Now, if you're already getting placenta for an induction, or if you're already doing this or this or that, you might not care. It might not be a big deal, and that's okay. But if you do care and you're like, well, I really kind of want to minimize all the things. So like Abigail was sitting here, you know, and you mentioned that you kind of want a more hands-off approach. You might ask to not have protocol uh, Pitocin unless it's needed. So unless there's a situation where you need it. So for example, again, I'm going to use myself an ex as an example. With my second birth, luckily I had no hemorrhaging issues and hemorrhaging is not super common. It's not super common. Um, depending on, you know, the kind of birth you've had in the past and what you can look up statistics, but it's not super common. So um, to say that you, every woman gets protocol placentas, I mean, Pitocin is like is it necessary? I don't know. And so usually you have a window about 30 minutes to an hour where, um, you know, your placenta might take that long to detach and come out, right, to birth it. Um, now, if you, now the thing about Pitocin that I wanted to mention too is if you're not planning to use Pitocin or to be induced, um, you might want to avoid routine Pitocin. Um, because there have been studies that showed that women who used Pitocin during birth were about 30% more likely to experience postpartum mood disorders. So not everybody, and it's not going to happen for everybody, but it could happen. It's just something to be aware of so that, you know, it's helpful in making your own decision of what's best for you. Now, if you're having hemorrhaging or, you know, something like that, and back to my own personal example with my third baby that I accidentally birthed here on the floor, um, I was hemorrhaging. And so when I went to the hospital, I did get Pitocin because I was hemorrhaging and I'm very realistic. I know what I need when I need it. 
right? And I'm I'm realistic. I needed it. So and I and I um, I did birth the placenta. It had no issues coming out, but I did birth the placenta in the back of the ambulance, which was very intense because it doesn't feel good. If you haven't had pain management meds, you do feel it come out. So you, what will happen is your uterus will continue to contract after the baby comes out when it's time for the placenta to come out. And so after the baby came out, it was maybe 30, I don't know, minutes or so. And I started to feel contractions again. I was like, oh gosh, you know, and I, it's not that I forgot. It was just, I was in such, I was so high. I had such a birth high that I kind of forgot and I'm like, oh crap. And so then I had to birth, you know, the placenta in the back of the, of the ambulance. Abigail, I told my husband, I'm more than confident delivering in the car. <laughs> well, you know what, Abigail, are there home birth midwives up there? Because delivering in the car would be really uncomfortable. And I only delivered my placenta in the car and that was not comfortable. All right. And would you suggest drinking placenta smoothies or doing the capsules if the hospital is okay with it? Okay. So that's what I want to talk about too, about birthing the placenta. So what do you want to do with your placenta? So you have options of things you can do with it, right? So protocol is unless you ask, most places will dispose of it as an organ. Now ask the hospital when you do your tour because it varies by hospitals, but these days most places will let you take it and do something with it. Um, now if you have an infection during pregnancy, you might not want your placenta to do something with, like to consume. Because if there's an infection in it, I don't know that that's a great idea. I would look it up and do the research if you have an infection. Um, only other thing I, I would consider doing, um, if you do have an infection, maybe plant, you know, maybe planting something with it. So that is really common that someone will plant their placenta. Um, now in terms of consumption, I have done uh, placenta encapsulation with all three babies. Um, so with my C-section I did, and basically, you know, I talked to a placenta encapsulator specialist ahead of time, um, and I had it set up so I knew what the plan was. We brought Ziploc baggies, um, because this was five years ago in Tampa, and it's just, it wasn't really common. And so we brought Ziploc baggies, and we asked the doctor who was doing my C-section. And I told my husband, like, I don't want to see the placenta. I just want to make sure it's in these bags and that we take it, you know. And so the lady came at the hospital. We texted her after I had the baby. She came to the hospital and picked it up and took it. So it wasn't like sitting out. We had it on ice and it was fine. Um, second and third, it was a little bit more, you know, fancy process. So, you know, I went with a different company. I was in a different state. And they basically gave me like, like a cooler bag and very specific instructions on what to do. And, you know, so I had them encapsulated. I grow very big placentas. And so I get a lot of capsules. And so why would somebody want to encapsulate and possibly consume? So smoothies might be something. So a lot of moms do smoothies. I've never done that. Um, I've done the encapsulation. So I had, they look like pills. So they dry it out and they turn it into pills. Um, there haven't been a lot of studies on, you know, there's not a whole lot of evidence out on the effects, but there is a lot of anecdotal evidence, meaning women that give their opinion of what their experience was like with it. And I am of, you know, the same opinion of most of the moms who answered these, you know, survey type things. So there was like 90 something percent of moms who have done placenta encapsulation reported a great experience. So they reported, um, you know, less instances of postpartum depression or postpartum mood disorders. Um, better milk supply so helping with your milk supply i think the biggest thing is the postpartum mood disorders right so because that's kind of a big deal very big deal and i can speak to that like i've never had um postpartum depression the baby blues yeah i mean i think every mom has baby blues right i mean it happens um but full-on postpartum depression or mood disorders i've been lucky enough that i haven't and i firmly believe that for me my placenta encapsulation was a big part of that and my support system because i've been very careful about how i plan my postpartum because i'm big on really putting a lot of effort and time into planning that postpartum phase because it's a huge adjustment. Um, Marissa, you wouldn't happen to have a list of questions to ask during the hospital tour. I feel like if I try to write my own down, I'll forget something. Um, let me think. I knew I had one for VBAC moms. Let me check. I don't know if I have one for like first time moms, but I do think that, you know, if you have the birth plan template, that's a good place to start. Because if you have questions, just think about as you go through it, like what would I, you know, if, if something pops up and you're like, huh, I wonder if I could do that, highlight it, you know, or something like that. And that way you can bring it up. Um, and let me see what I can find for you on that. Abigail, we have a few, but they're over an hour away. Okay. Yeah, that's a hike. 
that's a hike, Taylor, that will sometimes take your placenta for an autopsy of sorts. If you've had an infection in labor to find out what the infection was happened to me. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah. And that might be a situation where, you know, you don't want to consume your placenta. If you had an infection, it may not be a great idea. Um, and speaking of, you know, so placenta encapsulation pills, my baby will be six months old in a couple of days and I'm just now finishing my placenta pills. That's how many I had. And I have been diligent about taking them every day. I had a big, big placenta. I always do. I grow some big ones. If you didn't see the picture on my Instagram feed, go and check it out because that sucker was huge. Um, yeah. So by the time the placenta came out, the baby came out, the fluid came out, when all the things came out, I'm like, have you ever lost that much weight in one day? I don't know. Like it was amazing. I felt so relieved. Okay. So, um, we have a, let's finish. Let's finish. Um, all right. We have more to talk about. So let's finish up with, we've got afterbirth, umbilical cord, newborn. All right. Afterbirth. So an option that you may consider after the baby comes out is immediate skin to skin. There are a ton of benefits. I'm not going to go into all of them, but if you're interested, I would look it up. Um, but it, I mean, I cannot stress it enough like that initial, you know, as soon as immediate skin to skin if possible. Now you may say like, okay, this is something to consider. Um, if something is going on with you. So an example, I'll use myself again. So in my third birth, when we went to the hospital, we had the transfer. After the baby was born at home, we had the transfer in. So when I was getting um, my hemorrhaging under control, I wasn't able to do skin to skin because I was hemorrhaging and the, I was with the midwife and she was doing, doing the things. And so during that time, I had my husband do skin to skin and stay with the baby. And so that was something that I knew I wanted my baby to be getting skin to skin with me first. And if I was not able to do it, then with him. So that's something that you may consider too. Um, and then do you want the baby using a warmer? You know, you may not have to do that if you do skin to skin. Suctioning when the baby comes out. So suction, and I'm not going to go into great detail about all of the science behind all of these because I always suggest that moms do their research, but just know that these are options that you can consider. Um, you know, bulb suctioning. So if you've had a vaginal birth, the baby passes through your vaginal canal and the pressure of your body can push stuff out of, you know, out of their body and, and kind of do that suctioning. So you may not have to do suctioning if you don't want to. It's usually a protocol thing. Now, drawing the baby off and bathing and swaddling and all the things. So what you see is a lot of hospitals have a protocol that they very sometimes aggressively looking. If you've seen some videos, the way they clean the babies when they come out, um, wash them, clean them, scrub them, rub them. Like you don't have to do all those things. So there are a lot of benefits to keeping all that afterbirth on the baby. They call it burnix. It's like that cheesy looking stuff that they come out with. I mean, what's the rush? Like if you've been sitting there pushing or sweating or whatever, like you're probably already dirty, holding the baby in skin to skin with nothing, you know, none of that really, they call it, they, now they say rub it in, don't rub it off. So vernix. So holding the baby skin to skin, you don't have to clean all that stuff off right away. And then what you could do is take a towel or a blanket and put it over the back of the baby. So when I gave birth at home, we were just, everything happened so fast. I just grabbed towels and I put it over her. So I had her laying on me and I put it over her. Like she pooped all over me when she came out. Like as we were pulling her out and up, she pooped all the way up me. I mean, whatever, it was whatever. But you know, just know that that immediate cleaning off of the baby, you don't have to do. All right, let's talk umbilical cord clamping. Um, so this is something that if you're unfamiliar, um, when the baby comes out and your placenta comes out, even, you know, a lot of protocol is to just kind of go in, a lot of hospital protocol is to go in and clamp or cut the cord right away. Um, know that you don't have to do that. You can request delayed cord clamping. And I would find out at the hospital or with your provider what their protocol is. Um, why would you want to do that? Because there are a lot of benefits to allowing the blood to finish pulsing from the placenta to the baby. So the cord will appear like a purple color while there's still blood running. And when the blood is done pulsing, the clear the the cord will run clear. It'll look like clear. It'll the blood will be done. And so I recommend um, going on YouTube. There's a lady named Penny Penny Simpkin, and she has an amazing like two three minute video on delayed umbilical cord clamping that I always send to moms to check out because she shows the benefits plain as day. 
Um, so yeah, I would look into that. And then who you want to cut the cord when the time comes. You know, it doesn't have to be the doctor. You can have your, you know, your partner, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mom, whoever you want, if you want to do it. Um, so you can, you can suggest, you know, request that too. And then as far as newborn procedures go, what I'll say is, um, and I don't want to go into detail on all of the procedures because it can get a little controversial. It's really, you know, when you start talking about vaccines and ointment and medications, eye ointment, um, women get all hot and heavy and pissy if they don't do it their way, right? So I get it. You know, everybody, I don't get it because I don't think you should get like that. But I've seen it. So I don't want to start that debate here. It's more of I want you to, you know, do the research. If it's something important to you and you feel really strongly about something, you know, put that in your birth plan and have that conversation with your provider. And if you're wondering where to go for research, the CDC has some great things you can read about vaccines and the recommended schedule. And also evidence-based birth is an amazing website and she has articles on like every newborn procedure out there and she pulls research, every single research you can find. There are long articles, um, but if you, if it's something that's important to you, um, I would suggest checking that out. Her name is Rebecca, um, Dang, I forget her last name, evidencebasedbirth.com. So I'd suggest going there. Um, okay, and so one thing that I would consider too, when you start looking at your newborn procedures and what you want to have for the baby is maybe you want to have that first hour of having nothing done that isn't absolutely necessary. So if you can request, because listen, it's gonna take them a while, the nurses, the doctor, whoever's around, it takes them a while to clean up all the things. So feeling rushed is not something you should feel after the baby comes out, if you're able to, and there's no reason not to, um, you know, no medical reason, why not just have one hour of uninterrupted time with the baby? So sometimes they call that the golden hour. So if that, if you want to read up on it, Google the golden hour, but you can have one hour where you're just kind of getting to know your baby. Like you just went through birth, give yourself some grace and a little bit of a break. And so if you need to request that one hour that nothing is done, do it. And even some of those procedures can be done while you're holding the baby. And so, you know, you can ask that too. Or if you want to be nursing while they're doing things, you can do that too. So know that those are some options. Um, okay, and that's kind of it. The only other thing I want to mention is feeding. And so if you're a first time mom and you haven't done it before and you're thinking about breastfeeding, what I would suggest is start to look into breastfeeding and in, you know, now start to do your research now and try to get some ideas. When you go to your hospital tour, ask about lactation consultants on staff. And so a lot of hospitals will have a lactation consultant there. And what I'd recommend is after you give birth, immediately, as soon as you can request that the lactation consultant come to you. Uh, because nurses have some breastfeeding experience, doulas have some breastfeeding experience, but we do not. Nurses, doulas, none of us have as much as a lactation consultant. And breastfeeding is not always easy, right? Is it normal? Yeah. Is it common? Yes. Is it easy? Not always. It's hard, even for me. And I know all the things. And it's hard because you have two organs, a mouth and a breast that are trying to go together. And it sounds really easy, right? Like the baby puts his mouth on your nipple and gets the milk. It's not always that simple. There's a lot that goes into it. There's tongue ties and there's the way that they latch. And so, you know, we have doula, when I say we, I mean doulas, have a bit of experience, um, you know, in education about getting a good latch and all the things. But there are a lot of complicated, complicated situations where a lactation consultant, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. And I always suggest that moms talk to a lactation consultant. So that's my spiel on, um, on feeding, right? And so making sure, because the lactation consultants on staff at the hospital are busy. They have so many women to see. So that's why I say as soon as you can to request that, because it might take them a day, two days to get to you. And you that's a lot of nursing that you'll have to be doing for a day or two until you get to ask a question. If you're dealing with pain, if you're dealing with you know frustration, whatever you're dealing with, try to get that support ASAP, right? Okay, loves, 